going to go live very, very soon. I'm just going to double check and triple check that it's confirmed that it's recording. So I'll be able to get access to it. But I hope you all like my dad joke. <laughs> Anyone can tell any more dad jokes in the chat if you want. Cool. So we are officially live. Welcome everybody to capturing co customer context in this post-COVID world. If you are on YouTube, let us know what you're looking forward most post-COVID in the comments. In the chat, let us know what you're looking forward most post-COVID in the in the chat box below. And I'm Grace. I'm a, I'm the founder of Design Buddies and full-time I'm a product designer at Electronic Arts. We're so excited to have Cheryl here today. Um, on a talk about capturing co customer context for a post-COVID world. For this event, we'll be having our admin Jack host. Um, throughout this event, definitely keep your questions on Slido so we can make sure we capture them all. Feel free to make any live commentary you want in the chat. Just remember to be friendly to each other. And we'll also have a networking sheet where you can connect with Cheryl and each in all of our buddies um, as well. And towards the end, we will also have a group photo and a way for Instagram story, just like we do at all Design Buddies events. And if something really um, captures your attention during this event, feel free to share on social media and tag Design Buddies and Cheryl as well, um, your takeaways from this event. And with that, I'll, a, I'll leave the floor to Jack. Hi everyone, thanks Grace. I'm Jack, I'm a content lead at Design Buddies. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Cheryl today. Um, this has been one that we've been planning for quite some time. So I'm really excited to see it uh, actually come to life here. So Cheryl is a multi-talented designer, author, actress, and speaker whose work on emerging tech has reached hundreds of millions of customers, which is insane, across multiple industries. Her professional passions include natural user interfaces, applied storytelling and design and research and taming complexity in any manifestation. Cheryl's first book, Design Beyond Devices, creating multimodal cross device experiences, which is you know, we know what we'll be covering a lot today, um, was published by Rosenfeld Media in December, 2020. And a little more context on Cheryl before we jump in. Uh, Cheryl's career spans a wide variety of high profile projects at employers, including Amazon, where she worked on Alexa, Microsoft with Azure and Cortana, EA with the Sim series and a lot more. Um, she also owns design education company Idea Platz, uh, through which she shares her experience with conferences and companies worldwide. She's also an experienced actress and 13 year veteran performer and teacher at Seattle's longest running improv theater, Unexpected Productions. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to meet all the folks in the Design Buddies community, which has one of the best logos I've seen in a long time. Uh, so that, yes, very excited. And uh, let me know in chat if you can see the slides. I always have a fear that I've shared the wrong screen and I'm just showing you yourselves. Uh, so yes, it's good to see everybody. And thank you for the lovely introduction. Excellent, folks can see the slides. So we are good to go. So, you know, we had our introductory conversation uh, today almost said this morning, definitely not the morning. And there's a lot changing in our world. And that's part of what I'm here to talk to you about. With change comes a reset of our expectations, of our assumptions, and a need to broaden our perspectives. And one of the many things I talk about in my book is a new approaches to broadening that perspective. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So let me click over and we are designing products at the final frontier. Some of us more than others, but we are all creeping towards that vision of the bridge of the starship enterprise. Um, that, that is my shining holy grail of an experience where we can seamlessly move between speaking to the computer, working on a touch screen, pulling some physical controls, maybe working with something, uh, some augmented reality or some virtual reality and doing all of it without a lot of extra steps. The system just understands what you need to do and where you need to go and where you are. But to build a system like that uh, takes a lot of intentional effort and it takes a lot of orchestration of devices. You know, your customer already has five senses and a small universe of devices surrounding them right now. You do, I do, our customers do. Why aren't we designing for all of them? Why are we still primarily focused on, in general, a single device at a time or a single modality at a time? I'm working on a website. I'm working on a mobile app. Why aren't we taking a step back and thinking about experiences that span a modality across multiple devices? Um, 
part of it is that we don't understand why we do those things. And to, to understand the why, we need some broader customer context. So we don't need to go over this because uh, such a warm introduction, but a couple of other things that uh, I've worked on that may help inform some of the questions you ask me later. Uh, I've worked on Windows Automotive, so I've in the automotive space for two and a half years, so a lot of experience with a sort of high stakes multimodal design. Uh, sh shipped some of the first speech enabled DS video games, including Disney Friends and uh, and the herbs for the Nintendo DS, which was in the Sim series. And I've done several Alexa skills uh, solo. So there's, and I was the original UX designer on the Echo Look team. Uh, so a hybrid uh, hardware and software experiences. So, and I was the original designer for the Alexa notifications experience. I keep seeing stuff I designed like back in 2015 rolling out just now. And it's a very odd thing. It's a very odd thing for advice that's lived in my house for six or seven years to just continue to be like, oh, we worked on that. Um, so this is the book. We'll talk about it more later, but it rest assured that if you don't take fast notes or if you're still interested in this topic after the talk, uh, the book is here for you. And fun fact, Captain Picard is hidden on the cover and in the slides because I'm a nerd. So today we're going to cover a few different concepts. We're going to, first of all, we're going to make sure we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about multimodality. Then uh, we're going to go and talk about the spectrum of multimodality, which is one of the core concepts in the book. Uh, and then we're going to move to talking about a framework for capturing customer context that helps us, uh, that, that helps us remember how to get a holistic perspective of a person's lived experience. But first, let's talk about those definitions. So the website has been declared dead many times already. Many of you are working on them. So that's probably news to you. Uh, the web still thrives, but it's starting to thrive on many different devices. And the information contained on websites is now being mined and used in unexpected places like smart speakers. But let's take a second and just pretend that the pundits who were breathlessly reporting that the web was about to die were right. Like what, what would have replaced it? In 2016, we were all told, uh, you know, in Forbes, 10 ways to win the mobile first revolution. It was going to be mobile, mobile, mobile. And then a year later, Nielsen Norman's telling us, uh, but voice first? Yeah, voice first, future of interaction. Uh, that, that change could make your head spin. And you still sort of see this tension today where the, the industry can't really decide which one of these is most appropriate. And the reason the industry can't decide which of these is most appropriate is because our natural instinct to seek a winner is missing the point. There is no one true interface, not voice first, not mobile first. It depends on your customer's context and needs. A customer that loves voice first interfaces may not love it in a noisy environment. And most of the devices your customers are using are multimodal. So they have, they can have the choice if you as a designer work to give them the choice. And I strongly believe, and I know there are designers who are on the, in this boat with me, that the future is multimodal because humans are multimodal. A mode in this context of communication that we have right now is a type of communication. And humans communicate using their senses. Now, I don't mean like I'm broadcasting to you with my eyes, although Tyra Banks would tell you that you can broadcast communication with your eyes using smize. Uh, I did get better headshots after watching several uh, years of America's Next Top Models. So if you're ever in that, that perspective, you know, and try that. But um, we take in communication using our senses. So our communication modalities are revolve around our senses because we take in that communication using our senses. A multimodal interaction is an exchange between two entities, could be person in person, but in this case, because we are designers working on the digital form, device and a human being, where multiple input or output modalities can be used simultaneously or sequentially, one after the other, depending upon context and preference. It's not just what's appropriate, but sometimes it's just what people like. As I define them in the book, uh, these are the five primary communication modalities we talk about. 
the ones at the bottom are a little bit more subjective. The ones at the top, everybody pretty much agrees with. So obviously we have the visual communication modality. You get your e-readers and traditional GUIs. You're probably looking at some visual interface right now on your screen, unless my slides are taking up your entire, entire screen. But even then, uh, if you're looking at a static slide, that's a visual communication modality. Auditory, acoustic waves, not just speech, which you're getting right now, but sound effects and music are other ways of taking in uh, auditory information. Haptic communication is communicating meaning with changes to the physical environment. So that can be pressure, vibration, force feedback, uh, and force feedback can be things like the device pushing feedback back at you. It can be uh, sort of air displacement near you. They use that a lot at theme parks, just came back from Disney World, uh, and or direct manipulation like taps or clicks. Uh, so, you know, we get we've got this, the moving your mouse around is haptic input into your computer. And yes, uh, the I, your Apple Watch uses haptic feedback to you. If you use the vibration alarm, that's haptic feedback telling you wake up. Uh, the kinetic category is communication based on movement or orientation in space. So if you couldn't communicate using a single photo, you needed the string of photos, then you're probably con communicating using kinetic information. Movies are kind of a gray area. I think in general, they're, uh, they're multimodal. You've got some visual and some kinetic and some auditory going on in films. But if we take films off the table, uh, we look at the Xbox Connect, and, you know, appropriately named. Uh, kinetic communication being like air swipes or push uh, push movement. Uh, that's uh, you know communication based on movement. It is the movement of my arm that communicates my intent. Me just holding my hand out like this is not enough for the system to know what I'm doing. Me just holding my system my arm out like this is not enough for the system to know what I'm doing. It wants to know about the motion. Same with your pen input device. It's not about where the pen ends up. It's about the journey of the pen. That's kinetic information. Uh, if you're recording the mouse's movement, that's kinetic input, not just haptic input. And then our last category, ambient input, is inferred meaning driven by environmental or biometric conditions like temperature, heart rate, and lighting. This is a weird category because you're having an interaction with your devices in the moment that you're not immediately asking for. You know, you told your nest to turn on the turn on all of your systems when you walk into the house. You did not tell the nest to do it when you got there, but it's an interaction with the system. The system is interacting to your presence. You did express that intent at some other time in the past, probably. Um, so, and but you can also, you don't have to express intent to have an ambient interaction. If you have natural gas in your home, it smells of sulfur. That smell was added artificially as a warning to people, homeowners who might be exposed to a gas leak so that they know the gas has entered the home because otherwise it is silently in their home and the next time they light a match, their home will explode. Not a great situation for anybody. So that's an ambient interaction. Uh, the it, an environmental condition changes the ambient scent of the home and the, the homeowners, the, the hope is the homeowner will call and get the emergency dealt with. So what is multimodal design? The definition of multimodal design is it's design that seeks to coordinate the delivery of multiple input and output stimuli to create a flexible, coherent experience for our customers. But the practice of multimodal design is an additional layer of rigor on top of our existing modality specific designs like voice UI designs. I am not here to tell you that you have to throw away everything you've already learned. It's still relevant. We just have more complexity to deal with. So job security, <laughs> congratulations. You're still going to need to do full, full voice or GUI designs for multimodal experiences because when your customer is staying in that lane, they still need a consistent, predictable experience. It's Multimodal design deals with when they're not staying in the lane, when they're getting creative and moving between lanes. Speaking of lanes, this is one example. Uh, multimodal swim lanes for an airport transfer app on a smartwatch. So you're trying to book a cab 
while you're at the airport to get to your hotel. We've got, we'll look at this a little bit more a little bit later, but you can see that there's lanes for visual input, or lanes for physical input and audio input, and lanes for visual output and audio output. Um, you might have more lanes if your system has more input and output modalities, but um, the art of the multimodal design is to show that coordination between all of these different channels and how one type of multimodal input is going to impact one of the forms of multimodal output or multiple forms of output and how we move through time. Time is a big factor in our multimodal designs. So let's shift gears now that we've talked about those definitions. Let's talk about the spectrum of multimodality. So this is a core concept of my book, uh, and it, it gets us to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the entire sort of potential market of multimodal experiences, because not all multimodal experiences are created equal. Your watch is a multimodal experience. Your Echo Show is a multimodal experience. Your phone can be a multimodal experience. Uh, your uh, voice-enabled television can be a multimodal experience. But those things do not interact with you in the same ways. There have been decisions made based on the customer context. And once we understand what parts of the customer context are important, then we can move to the next part where we talk about how we get that customer context. So from the echo to automotive, smartwatches to your television, not all these multimodal experiences are cre created equal. So how do you choose the right interaction model? And how do you understand what interaction models are out there? In my experience, working on a wide variety of these experiences from the Nintendo DS, very constrained, Windows Automotive had a lot of different uh, modality options, but we were very uh, high stakes, did not want people to crash, and we need to be very specific about our choices to Cortana for the desktop and phone, uh, to working on uh, Alexa, you know, that all of those things are very different. And even in, within Alexa, we had the Echo Show, which had a screen, and the Echo, which did not, and the Echo Look, which worked on a mobile phone. So there's a lot, and the Fire TV, which had big screens. So all of those things were slightly different, but patterns started to emerge. And I found that there were two dimensions that were most interesting when we started to look at those patterns. The first dimension that was most, that was super interesting was how rich is the information you need to communicate to your customer? You might have mostly Low, inf low information density information. So what is the temperature? Uh, set, what is this SMS message, which is going to be under a certain number of characters? Or are you trying to communicate high density information like video, the summary of a news article? Uh, are you trying to uh, show a some like a snapshot of the entire stock market with multiple st stocks all at once, which is no longer high density or like help people pick out movie times, which apparently is now a thing again, people can go to the movies. So that that that's a hard problem on voice because you, you've got, you have to communicate what movie, what theater, what times, and then somehow go back and forth and pick one of those very hard when you're doing that on a mo medium that can only show you one or two things at once. So understanding how much information your customer needs from you, very important when making these choices. The other piece of information that's really important is how close are the device and the customer? Now, it doesn't have to be this, this it can be variable, but what, what is the customer's relationship to the device? In some cases, the customer is always going to be in pro close proximity to the device. So they're going to be either wearable or in arm's reach because of the nature of the device. My watch doesn't work unless it is connected to me because it locks as soon as it's taken off my body. That's just the way it works. Um, it was designed that way. Uh, you know, certain sensors re are also require it to be connected to me. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality only work if there's someone connected to them who could directly see through them and the current constraints of those visual technologies mean the device has to be near me and I have to be near it. Maybe someday you'll be able to just beam those that information into my brain from far away, but right now that's not true. So if I'm doing VR or AR, the device is going to be near me. But in other cases, the customer may not be necessarily 
near the device. And if the customer has flexibility, if they can go long range, if they can move three to 10 feet away from the device, suddenly a lot of the assumptions that you would have made no longer apply. If you have a smart speaker like Alexa, she or it, uh, you, you're not going to, we can't assume you're going to look at it when you talk to it uh, because you're somewhere else. Like you might be in a different room. Uh, it might, it might not actually be visible to you. We certainly can't assume you can touch it because 10 feet away is not touching distance. Uh, and so understanding that those two pieces, very important for helping you make the right multimodal choices. Once you have that context, then you can place your potential experience on the spectrum of multimodality. On this graph, I've got the uh, proximity on the horizontal axis and the scope of information on the vertical axis. And when we do that, each quadrant turns into a different cluster of potential experiences. Uh, our first quadrant up in the upper right, and I've always found the numbering of quadrants in math particularly odd, but I'm going with the standard. So first quadrants up or, or upper right, adaptive experiences of the holy grail, experiences that can support both close proximity and long range interactions, because we've got customers who need rich interactions, but might be going far away. And so we want to help them have those rich long those rich close interactions when they choose to but also support them when they're wandering around doing something that's farther away with some modicum of information maybe it's not always the rich information they want but we can give them something the second quadrant over in the upper left anchored experiences uh, experiences with the rich physical presence where customers usually nearby because we're in the close proximity part of the, the chart and rich information. And so these are things like your set top boxes, like your fire TV and your desktops and laptops like Cortana on PC uh, or just windows in general, uh, your gaming consoles, those sorts of things. Quadrant three in the lower, in the lower left hand uh, side of the graph, close proximity and scoped information. So the customer and device must be in direct contact or extreme proximity for use. And if the customer has to be in extreme proximity, oftentimes that means the experience has limits. You know, my watch is only so big because it has to come with me. Uh, artificial reality uh, and mixed reality devices right now, if you've ever seen a HoloLens, is actually just kind of like a postage stamp bit of a, a, a augmented reality and the rest is just regular reality. So it's it's right now it's pretty constrained. Uh, so it only really works with scoped information. Uh, virtual reality kind of sort of splits this line. If you have a good VR system, maybe it's more of an anchored experience. And then intangible over in the lower right hand quadrant is your smart speakers. These are hands free experiences where pro proximity to the device is not required. These are situations where the customer isn't necessarily going for a lot of high density information. They're not going to be near the device. So we're going to build a bunch of experiences that don't assume physical contact or proximity. How do you choose? You need to understand your customer's context to know what interaction model makes sense in the moment. Because as I mentioned, your customer has a constellation of devices around them. And it's gonna feel weird to them if you've picked the wrong device to implement your experience. Uh, you know, if you've got this experience that's just perfect for smart speakers, but you choose a desktop that only works in one area of the house. Like if you put together a, a, a recipe, like or like a cooking app today and it's just on desktop slash tablet, it's going to feel a little weird because a lot of people do have smart speakers, smart speakers in their kitchen in some form. And uh, the kitchen's a very dynamic, adaptive, friendly space. Like your hands are covered in butter. You don't want, it's a it's stuff splashing everywhere. You don't want an expensive device in there. You want something that adapts to the changing conditions. The context matters. So are you are your customers frequently in a living room when they need this information and thus near a rich device? Are they constantly on the move? And therefore, you probably want to see if you can constrain the information enough to get it onto a direct uh, into a direct relationship. Uh, is it something that's fairly low, fairly low density and is compatible with an intangible experience that could be really satisfying for customers? Or is it something that's in a highly volatile environment where they need a lot of different types of information? Adaptive might be your bag. And as a side note, 
most of our assumptions about how the way the world works have changed since May, since March 2020. And we know this maybe innately, but just to speak it into the world, a lot of things we could take for granted when we moved into an, a, a user research study, we can't take for granted anymore. I mean, we've all seen, and I think we were, I know I was, <laughs> I sort of had this idea in my head of like what a home office looked like. And certainly I've been disabused of that notion uh, that all of these Zoom cameras looking into other people's homes have humbled me and made me look at the wider perspective of how divergent people's contexts are. And if I'm going to be working on something that requires uh, folks to interact with it in a home context, I need to get better context about like, what are these folks actually doing? Are they working from a kitchen desk, like from a kitchen table? Or are they working from a couch? Or are they working from a dedicated desk? Because it seems equally probable that all of those things are happening. And it's wildly different ergonomics uh, and, and conditions in all of those spaces. And the same applies to public transportation, travel, family gatherings, education, all of those things vastly different now. And you'll notice I didn't mention smartphones. And that's because they're difficult to classify, in my opinion, based on, on the type of, and I think it depends on the type of content you're presenting. For productivity scenarios, for me, I believe the smartphone experience belongs in the direct quadrant. It's a short range experience, but it feels constrained when compared to full laptop screens because you're looking at something that's very high density. You're looking at like a PowerPoint or a full Word doc through what is essentially a like a cardboard tube version of that you're getting to see a tiny little piece of it uh, and that's not fulfilling it's not optimized for that particular content and i think that's why you don't see a ton of content creation on mobile phones but optimized experiences like gaming land more in the anchored quadrant because you are still close range to the device but the constraint part no longer it really applies as much like you can you're getting the right kind of rich information to the customer uh, you're getting the things the phone is good at like graphics and animations to the customer so it's rich but it's not the rich stuff that the phone's kind of bad at and then voice enabled apps like alexa where you can either interact with traditional gui or you can talk to it are pushing into adaptive where customers could choose their interaction model based on what they need to do and what their conditions are in the moment. So the spectrum of modality, uh, uh, multimodality is complex, but it's worth it. Multimodal flexibility and choosing the right model and the right devices for your customers isn't just about an arbitrary choice, it's about inclusion. The more modes you support and the more people you support, you might choose to create two separate experiences that exist in two quadrants, but then you're supporting two different types of interaction and probably supporting two different groups of users with very different needs. Uh, and that is inherently more inclusive. Uh, if you build a system that is fluid and adaptive and you hit quadrant one successfully, that's very inclusive. Uh, as opposed to just saying, well, we're just going to optimize for the visual haptic experience of people who aren't able to interact in those ways. They're just going to need to find an accessibility tool on their own and work it out. Um, my hope is that as our devices are mostly capable of workarounds now, we start building those workarounds into our products and making them a feature that everybody can use. A lot of great design innovations have started that way. So let's move into our last area of focus, which is the capturing customer context. So expanding your understanding so that you can build a stronger foundation upon which to build your multimodal product. So as I mentioned, what we thought we knew about the world as researchers and designers has changed. A question I'm going to be facing in my work very soon, just a couple weeks when I go back into the office to observe behavioral patterns when uh, the Gates Foundation goes back to work is, hey, are whiteboards and stickies really the, high, the holy grail of creativity when we're in a hybrid world? My hypothesis is that they are not and that we're probably going to need to get rid of whiteboards because in previous uh, pre-COVID times, we had teams that were in two different locations and the whiteboards became a power dynamic. The team that was larger and drove the whiteboards had control over the ideas. And now that we are supporting a 50-50 model, um, there's always going to be one team that's in control of those ideas if we allow people to continue to use whiteboards and physical brainstorming. So instead, we're going to have to switch to more digital forms of 
of brainstorming unless a team has managed to get themselves all in the same space. But then just think about it practically. There's a lot of touching things here. It's just, you know, as or as we call it in the biz, fomites, germy surfaces. There's a lot of fomites involved in design brainstorms. Are people really going to reach for shared whiteboard markers? I don't know, especially if Delta and Gamma break out and we're like half back to the office and th that's an issue while we're still near each other. Like logistically, I think we a lot of p companies that didn't make a transition to digital brainstorming will still have to do so. <laughs> We've all learned that there's no such thing as a typical home office. Like, is it kids interrupting or is it pets interrupting? Like, you know, what, what is the, which weird angle is the camera at for your, for folks? And how does that impact people's, uh, people's perception of you? You know, what types of technical issues are people having with the hardware that they have? Um, how does the space that they're in impact them by the end of the day? Because ergonomics are a thing and most people are not ergonomic experts. Uh, so there's tons to consider around home office setups. So as was mentioned in the, uh, the very gracious intro, I am also a professional actress and I have been working with a theater called Unexpected Productions, which is an improv theater in Seattle for the past eh, 13 years and change. And when you're a paid actor, people are in a professional theater, people pay money and the contract is you will do something that is funny or interesting. And when you walk on stage, the expectation is that your scenes will be compelling fast. Like they're not really going to give you like 20 minutes to get around to compelling. They're like, this is a professional, they better figure it out. And so when we teach students or when we're working on our own sort of professional ensemble, we have a shorthand for the elements of storytelling that are required to give our audience members a holistic perspective of a human's experience that's plausible enough that their brain starts to fill in all the rest of the details. And for us, we use a storytelling shorthand we call CROW, which stands for character, relationship, objective, and where. Uh, so we, we try to define an element from each of these categories as early as possible because that creates the sense of a real, actual, believable human scenario. So now we're going to take it from another perspective and say like, hey, let's look at it from your stakeholders perspective or from your perspective to get a real believable human scenario that we can design with. We better have all four of these things, whether that means we're trying to convince a VP that we should not cancel the Echo Look or whether that means uh, we're trying to figure out what, you know, which of our spectrum of modality quadrants we want to position ourselves in. So let's dive a little deeper into each of the four elements of Crow. C stands for character. So how do you break down character? Because we talk about it a lot in acting, but I imagine you have not had philosophical conversations about this at your lunch breaks. When I teach introductory improv, this uh, breakdown, which I got from a book called The Improv Handbook, uh, really resonated with me, which broke character down into three, uh, three characteristics attributes, attitudes, and choices. And you can kind of think of these as concentric rings for what defines a person. So the most core is the attributes, fundamental traits, mannerisms, and habits. Uh, these are things that are least likely to change. It doesn't mean they can't change. When we look at things like gender, identi gender identity and preferred pronouns, people may, or, you know, or sexual uh, identity, these things may, you know, people may go through an awakening. They may you know, maybe it was in there all along, but they didn't know. But it's not going it, to, it rarely changes a ton, which is not to say it can't change a couple times, but these things change at a fairly slow rate. They are very core to who our customer is. And so some example questions, like how does your customer define their own identity to themselves and others? Like one question I sometimes ask is like, if you had to write a social media bio, what would you put in it? Like, how would you describe yourself in just a few characters? Like, what what is most important to you? Um, it might not get to all the all the characteristics you're interested in, but it tells you what's important to your customer, and that's a starting point because your priorities and their priorities may be different. You also want to dig into like which of their attributes are most underrepresented and how might that affect them. 
uh, they, you know, especially if they happen to be sort of transgender or of an underrepresented ethnic group, that is going to have an extreme impact on the, their relationship with the product, on the experience with the world around them, on the way errors can affect them. You know, if you are an immigrant to the United States and you, English is a second language and a device does not understand you properly, that doesn't just frustrate you, it taps at your sense of identity because you've been trying to speak English for a long time and this device is judging you. It's telling you that you're not American enough or something along those lines. That's not what you intended, but that's the way that person is going to feel because they live in a different context than you. So attributes, very important. Attitudes are emotions and reactions to outside stimuli, other people, objects, or situations. So this is, you know, there's the core about us and then there's kind of what we've collected over time. Like uh, what the sort of how we feel about stuff, uh, other people, objects or situations, although we have a whole R in Crow for relationships. So a lot of this is about objects and situations. And a big question ask, or maybe not in this specific way, but would this customer have any preconceived notions or learned behaviors that they would bring to bear on this experience? You know, I think that's a really important question when we talk about coming out of COVID. We, you know, when we talk about uh, if you want people to hang out in a small space and they it turns out that their attitude towards, to, towards being in a small space has permanently changed, it's important to get that out there. And I don't think we know how widespread people's uh, like willingness to go back into like an elevator with strangers is versus like people's feeling that like social distance should be forever. Uh, that's that's something we would want really want to dig into, and something we would never have asked about before COVID is like, what is your com like what is what does personal space mean to you, and what is acceptable and what is not. And then choices are the actions you take based on your beliefs and attitudes. So, you know, as they say, actions speak louder, louder than word, words. So these are things people have chosen to do in the past, even when customers can't necessarily explain like a preconceived notion, actions can tell you a lot about what their values are and what's important to them. Uh, why, why would a customer choose to seek out your experience if they're existing customer, like, Try to get it. Why? How did they do it? Like what, what was around that choice? What process led to that choice? Did they have a choice? Often they do not if it's an enterprise product. Uh, so that's important to know too. Uh, and there are a variety of other choices people make. Like why did they choose this education? Why did they choose this car? Why did they choose the smartphone that they have? Uh, we'll talk about smartphones a little bit in relationships. And then these together define that holistic person. R for relationships, what connects your customer? The closer you are to someone or something, the more likely you are to get emotional about it. Relationships drive satisfaction and frustration. So human to device relationships can be things like device ownership, like is this mine or is this shared? Anthropomorphization, did I name it? Uh, an emotional attachment, but also self-expression. Like if I chose to buy this phone because it expresses who I am, if you break it, you have like injured my sense of self. That's not good. Uh, human to business, something we're probably all familiar with, generally things about like how the customer perceives you and why they work with you. Human to human, cooperative use, sequential use, trust, identity competition. We don't always think about this. We often think about this relationship as one-to-one, -one. customer, device, but there are people around your customer. Are they sharing that device? If it's a PC, they might have multiple logins. Uh, if it's a phone, is the person handing it off to their kids? Because that can really change the relationship with the device. Uh, are they competing with others while using this product in some way? Uh, how do they express their identity through the, project, the product? Um, or how do they express their identity when they're logging in? All the, and what is their sense of trust with the product and the people around them? You know, like if you have a smart speaker and you're trying to build a banking app, Trust is a big thing. If they don't trust the people who are usually around them, that banking app is not going to fly as an intangible experience because it's just that the, the trust isn't there. Objective, hopefully this is just a reminder to all of us as designers that we need to know what our customer is trying to accomplish. And rem just ask yourself, is the thing we believe the customer is trying to accomplish truly their end goal or simply a sentence written to get the customer to our feature? Like we all have to ask ourselves this question over and over again. 
And if we believe that like, yes, this is a human goal. For example, when I worked at Azure, sometimes people would say, well, the user story is, I browse a list of virtual machines. It's like, no, no one browses a virtual machine list for fun. It, there's, there's nothing fun about that. They're browsing the list of virtual machines because they wanna find the one that's broken so they can reboot it. That is the human goal. And the other reminder here is don't assume that your solution stands alone. You, you wanna make sure that you're looking broader at the potential device agnostic human objective that might span multiple experiences. Are people generating data in another app that's feeding into your experience? Are they using other devices, other things uh, that, you know, like banking, are they using Mint in addition to your banking experience? And what does that mean? Uh, for how things work. A lot of banks don't understand that their two-factor authentication is getting pinged by an app like Mint. And then you'll get texts at like three in the morning. It's not favorite. And don't obstruct objective. Timing and context matter. Like, even if you're like, I have something really of value, if it's later, if it's value later, and you come up in front of someone's objective and try to interrupt them now, you're obstructing objective in the moment. Like if I go to a furniture store, like this example from Nielsen Norman, and I give you this dialogue, it's like, hey, can you keep a secret? First of all, I that is not a human goal, keeping a random secret for a furniture store. Second of all, I did not come to this website to keep a secret for a furniture store. I came to look at furniture and you pop this up to get between me and my furniture store search. I, you know, I'm still in that like looking for a relationship situation. I might just jet. Don't get in the way. You can offer things of value later when customers accomplish their objective. And the final element of Crow is where. What surrounds your customer? And you may not be experienced at asking about these things because you may not have been doing ethnographic research. You may have been assuming that people were in a traditional office environment. There may be a lot of reasons, but when you're working on multimodality, this is super, super important. Uh, questions like, where will your customer be when they want to interact with you? Like if it's a, if it's a long range experience, is it a bedroom? Is it a kitchen? Is, uh, is it multiple rooms? Will they be seated, standing, moving? What is in arm's reach? If the phone is in arm's reach, then that has a big influence because anything you design that's harder than doing it on the phone, they're just gonna pick up the phone. So you gotta keep that into consideration or other devices. What devices will be available? Can they work in context? Who else will be in those environments? Back to the relationship with other people. Uh, it's important to understand like, is this public or is it private? Are there distractions in the environment? important for deciding whether or not like spoken interfaces is appropriate in those situations or acoustic communication at all. Will customers expect to continue this experience between locations or devices? Like if they talk to us about moving, now we have to talk about like what their train of thought is and why, like when you get done with the car, what, what, do you ex what happens now when you get to the house and what do you expect to happen when you get in the house? Like, did you, I don't know how many of you have had, like you listen to music in one place and then you go in the car and it like plays the wrong thing or it like always plays the A song in your Bluetooth list instead of like the last thing you actually played, which is what you want. It's a failure to consider continuation of experience. So for folks uh, who are interested in applying this in their work, uh, the good news is I have a lot of materials on my website. I have some customer context worksheets. So these are physical, uh, this set of worksheets. Uh, so you can print these if you are in one of those paper environments and use these for a shared understanding workshop. Because the complaint I heard early on from folks was like, well, this is all great, but uh, my stakeholders think we know everything about our customers. So this series of work of, of uh, worksheets is designed to get everybody sharing what they think they know turning it into a crow uh, sort of understanding, and then uh, you, comparing that to a set of example questions and seeing where your, amp your open areas are. And so as a group, you come together and say like, oh yeah, we actually don't know these three things. We should do some research on that. Instead of it just being like, oh, we know our customers. It's like, let's get more specific. You share everything you think you know with me as an expert. We'll pull all the expert knowledge and then we'll identify the stuff we still don't know. I also have a mural template for a similar workshop for those of you who are digital. And I have an interview guide with Crow inspired questions, which is also available on my website for you to download. 
uh, and there's a couple notes like that isn't intended as a like just read it one to whatever. It's questions that'll inspire you to build your own uh, interview guide, uh, but help, will help you dive into each of the four attributes of Chrome. So defining your platform just really quickly, how do you decide what channels and multimodal interaction models are most appropriate for your experience? You know, anchored experiences are best when you want to convey a lot of information and multimodality is usually used as a shortcut, like Bing on Xbox was used to find movies and where they streamed because it took a lot of clicks to do that. Great use of multimodality there. Direct interactions are best when you have a few key, often repeated tasks. And you can do a lot of shortcuts with sensors if it is connected to the body, like eye tracking or heartbeat, heart rate, but it's not well suited to text consumption or browsing. Intangible is really good for like questions and answers and search, really super hard in multi-user scenarios. Just, we have not figured that out yet. And then adaptive is most inclusive, most expensive and best when your customer context is likely to change like that kitchen and scenario where it's one moment i'm just looking at a recipe the other moment everything has exploded the blender is all over the place my hands are covered in goop and i just need to know what the next timer i need to set is so an example scenario for putting it all together your customers are planning and booking a big trip in advance but they're not doing it from a single location they're going from a commute to their homes a commute is a thing where people go from work to home or home to work some of you have not done that for a while um, so in this example if i'm using my phone on like a train or a bus i'm having a direct interaction uh you know i'm browsing potential neighborhoods via like the company website using touch controls on the small screen so the company website's probably using responsive design i'm not getting all of the data i would on the ma main website uh, but it's giving me some way to like shortlist a few options like i'll favorite these things and come back to them later and look at them when i have a bigger screen available now depending on my scenario like my context i might have a couple of different approaches maybe a if i'm part of just like a, a couple i might go home uh and browse the short list with my spouse uh, using a laptop top screen a keyboard and trackpad which is an anchored experience uh so that we can just review additional details and make final selections um, so in that case if it's often a paired experience that might have some additional implications once we have that context for how we design that site but you might also find that hey maybe this is actually this travel brand has a lot of families using it and they want to use it on their their tv because they have so many folks sharing it and the journey is as much fun as the destination so the whole family wants to get involved we're browsing the short list of results on a set top box app with a tv remote the kid and we enable use multimodality to let the kids ask questions verbally and see the answers on screen and this way we get everybody involved we're building something multimodal and in both cases, we've transitioned from a constrained close range interaction to either a rich UI with close range or a rich UI with long range interactions. Now, to enable those transitions, there are some other things you need to work on, which I talk about in the book, things like identity and transition. Your system's gonna need to way to identify that it's you transitioning from your phone to either of those experiences. You'll need portable session context to maintain what you searched and what you saved and favorited. And ideally, you'll need flexibly structured content. Ideally, your content should adapt to multiple form factors and should limit the amount of detail displayed on constrained screens when appropriate. Like if you just slam all the hotel details on a constrained screen, that's a choice, but it makes it a lot harder for me to actually browse through conveniently and look at a lot of things at once on that constrained screen. You're not letting the device do what the device does best. And when you're documenting things, when you get to the point where you're documenting multimodal designs, within a scenario, you want to document the initiation, the transitions between states, any decision points, and any backend systems you're pulling from. Whereas across all scenarios, you're going to want examples of any multimodal intents, the key moments in any of your input and output modalities and any interactions that can be completed in more than one modality uh, and how you might work between them. So again, this is an example of a key moment where the customer's in a high stress situation, they're trying to get out of the airport, we can transition between modalities. So we're documenting those transitions. Uh, they have a decision point, uh, they're choosing which airport transfer 
they want between rideshare and train. So we're documenting several of those types of things in a single flow. The same system that powers a website today can be extended to power a whole constellation of multimodal experiences. And I challenge you to meet your customers where they are by understanding their context and supporting the modalities and devices they need. This past year has been a difficult journey for all of us, but we can use this moment of change to push for more humanistic designs. We start by asking new questions. Someone is going to build this bridge. Is it going to be you? Hope so. Hope someone builds it because I want to use it. Uh, you can visit the book site online, find all the materials. Uh, there's also podcasts, sample chapters, all kinds of good stuff uh, at bit.ly, capital DBD, dash idea plats. Or you can just browse to it on the site. There's a discount code that you'll be getting in the email. And uh, also, if you go today or tomorrow, we're running a summer sale on rosenfeldmedia.com, so you won't need the discount code. You, any individual book is 20% off, and all print orders come with a free ebook at Rosenfeld Media. You could also get it at Amazon if you just want your Kindle book, but uh, it's a slightly better deal if you go through Rosenfeld right now. And if anyone, if you want a signed book plate, a uh, free signed book plate, you can send a name and mailing address to me at Cheryl at ideaplats.com. I don't track that information. I just use it to send out the book plate. And you can visit ideaplats.com for information on my works, uh, workshops, talks, and any of those downloads. So let's talk questions. Uh, the discount awesome. code is going to get emailed out too, but we'll uh, put that up a little bit there. Yes, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was so informative. Uh, lots of lots of knowledge dropped right there, and I'm excited for whoever ends up designing the the bridge as well. I want to use it too. Um, before we hop into questions, I think this would be a great time, Grace. If you want to take over, we could do a little group wave, and then we can use that to kind of transition into our Slido questions. Yeah, for sure. I'll give everyone a few seconds to turn on the camera. If I've actually been sharing some takeaways on our Instagram story, so make sure to check that out. If you all of you in the audience found any interesting takeaways, make sure to post them on social media. We're, we're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and tag Cheryl and Design Buddies, what you learned today. And I'll give it 10 seconds and do a group photo in a way for our Instagram story. And I'll do all the pages as well. So feel free to grab any object. I see some of you grabbing your pets. Sometimes we do this where we grab like stuffed animals for our photos. So I'll just give it 10 seconds feel free to also connect with each other, connect with Cheryl on social media, and also submit your questions on Slido. So Jack will be hosting a Q&A next. So lots of great questions on Slido. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, smile. I'm gonna make sure this is captured. I, I, I don't have any feedback if it's captured, so that's why I double check. All right, we're going to do a way for our Instagram story. So feel free to dance, dab, wave, whatever you want. Um, so you'll be posted on our social media as well. All right, ready, set, wave. Hello, everybody. We are at Capturing Customer Context for Post-COVID World with Cheryl Platts. We learned about how things would change after COVID. Like, will people actually want to whiteboard together in person again? So yeah, watch the recording to find out. And thank you, everyone, everyone for coming. Cool. We're going to hop into the Q&A. So Jack, I'll, I'll um, leave the floor to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, Jess, if you could link the Slido in the chat again, that would be great. Uh, there have been some really interesting ones I've been going through. Before we go to our highest rated ones, there was one that was kind of, um, given the context of how we ended there, that I thought was pretty interesting, um, which was, how important is device improv or device adaptability to respond to how users will want to interact with them in consideration of multimodal design? I thought that one was super interesting. Uh, I think of how my dad tries to use Siri and how he can never get an actual response. So uh, that would be great to hear your hear your take on that, Cheryl. Your example of how your dad uses his Siri is an excellent example, Jack. Like we, rigidity is the enemy of inclusivity. And it's, it's and I, the challenge for designers is it's really hard to make a strong case for, uh, 
for the expense and complicated work required to get to that device improv state of existence. Uh, but what it does is it built, gives us a much more robust experience. It gives us an experience that helps us adapt to unexpected uh, evolving patterns of use more effectively. Uh, we don't always know the ways people are going to use our devices, but the more options we give them, uh, the more likely we are to be able to adapt in that moment. Uh, I have another talk called Optipessimism, where I talk about how important it is to be able to adapt to the circumstances we couldn't predict. Uh, and, you know, talking about COVID, you know, the talk title was post-COVID. COVID's a disability machine. Uh, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people living with post-COVID disability symptoms. And whether that's affecting them physically via exhaustion, uh, or whether it's neurological symptoms that are going to impact their speech or their physical control of their hands, like there are genuine impacts to the way they interact with devices. And having more flexible systems that are in that adaptive quadrant are going to be game ch changers, changers for people. Now, to get people to fund that work requires a rich story. And that's why the customer context is so important. And then like another thing I talk about in my book is like storyboarding and getting your ideas across and like getting that context into your stakeholders head. The echo look would have been canceled years in advance if we had not uh, been able to con convincingly take what we had learned from ethnographic research and take that customer context and bring it to life for our VPs. Uh, so I think it's, I think it's super important for a specific set of scenarios. There are situations where you have straightforward use cases where you can get away with more uh, sequential multimodality where people choose one or the other, but they don't have to be like fluidly moving back and forth. Like if it's just like turn on the lights, turn off the lights, you can give people either voice or a button as opposed to like the fluidity of adaptive where it's like you just you could do anything at any time and you could switch uh you could you could build something which is either or if you're only ever working in those short crisp uh very well defined interactions yeah thanks for that um i also saw another another interesting uh question that was about constraints with echo maybe we'll get to that but i want to get to some of these um upvoted questions and we'll start at the top uh pretty broad one why is multimodal design so important moving forward especially coming out of COVID? well uh it's a good segue from the last question the increasing number of disabled people that we are designing for aging population also uh, to to your point jack with your the way your father handles technology we know that in many countries aging population is a huge concern and so the technology that we have uh the, the stereotypes about how our elderly companions and f family members interact with technology are not just all about, oh, they're baby boomers, they didn't grow up with technology. A lot of the problems people have are because of physical or cognitive impairments or, or something along those lines. And it, it is the adaptivity of these devices that allows them to choose in the moment or allows the device the flexibility to adapt to them. Post COVID, we some of the modalities that you know i talk about in the book like gesture and voice some people pre-covid still viewed those as like you know show ponies you know like oh that's cool but what do we, we're still fine with what we have we're still fine with desktops we're still fine with phones but like reception desks what are they like are we just going to put human beings in the front and expose them to literally every single human being that comes through no that's not practical. Some people, some companies probably are, and that's going to be a really rough job. And those people are not going to be paid enough for the risk they're exposed to. But, you know, we're probably going to want to have self check in. But then again, if you do it with a touch device, now you got self check in with a big old tablet full of fomites. So is there a different way to do self check in? And is that a uh, cross device? Is it your phone to another device? Is it gestural? Like, is it, uh, you know, do we use things like clear, which are kind of gestural and biometric input? There's a lot of different moving parts that to move us from a world which was very tactile to a world where we're fo emphasizing distance from devices, distance from other people, uh, minimizing physical contact with surfaces and other people. Uh, multimodality can help us 
do those things in a more responsible way, in addition to helping us meet our unfortunately newly disabled long COVID haulers where they are and the aging population. Yeah, that's so cool. What I'm hearing is a lot of uh, multimodal design will help optimize our experiences, but also there's kind of this important layer um, in regards to accessibility, um, which is so interesting. We just had a recent talk about designing for accessibility that kind of segues into this next question. Um, in that conversation, we talked about how accessibility is actually a business consideration as well. Um, and so someone asked, do these multimodal considerations help the bottom of the line of a company? And if so, how is that? Well, I believe that they can. Now, I can't give you the numbers for your specific company, but and I, I made this point when talking to uh, the folks who wrote conversations with things more recently and we're talking with them about multimodality is like it's not just you know checking the accessibility box, but it's expanding your market if you create an, an experience that is inherently adaptive because the thing is a lot of so when folks who are living with accessibility issues one either have to get super expensive uh tools to work around things that are not in enough accessible enough on their own expensive tools which may or may not be available to folks who are newly disabled or are you know disadvantaged in some way and two even if you have access to those tools they can be inconvenient it can be, it is not a guarantee that a particular website or tool is going to interact the way it's supposed to, like terrible website UI can still trip up screen readers, right? And so, you, and those things are easy to overlook. Whereas if you build a system that's just inherently going to allow people to choose the method that works best for them for interacting, and it's built into the product, it doesn't necessarily require additional tools. Like I don't need a screen reader because there's a way for me to interact with this with my voice that comes back with audio feedback. So it's on the audio channel without any translation. Uh, I if I'm an if I am somebody who has that disability, I may be more likely to choose your products than all the other ones in the market where I have this sort of, you know, inconsistent experience that's not fluid, where sometimes I don't have ex full access to the things that other people do. And ideally, the work you put in to doing that fluidity is also going to make your experience more compelling to regular customers too. That, you know, Microsoft's accessibility toolkit talks about both temporary and permanent disabilities. And so even folks who are not living with a permanent disability, you probably heard about this last week, or last time you had a talk, uh, may have a temporary disability of some sort. And that could be something as simple as like somebody holding a baby and so they don't have access to their arms for a moment, or somebody who has, you know, broken their arm uh, and is not able to type reliably or something along those lines. And those people have even less likelihood of having access to the adaptive tools because those require training and funds and all of those things. So you're helping those people as well. Uh, and uh, and it's so it's ideally going to make your broaden your market with disabled folks if you do it in the right way and you include disabled folks to make sure that you genuinely are including them. And ideally, it's going to make it more appealing to everybody, both for folks who like the flexibility, just just like it better. I love using my voice more. Uh, and people who genuinely need that flexibility because of some situational concerns. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, one final question before we head out is where do you see the future of multimodal design going and what industries should we expect it in the more recent future, you know, in the more near future? Very interesting question. I think I think that we're going to see some unexpected growth in the office sector because of what's happening post COVID. I think it's going to be a slow roll because I think that we're going to have to observe people, people's behaviors changing before we come to a realization as an in, a, a industry that there's an opportunity there. And, and then like a whole bunch of stuff will flood really fast. But when we think about Teams and we think about Zoom and we think about like the brainstorming tools, I think we're going to realize that there's an unmet need 
that offices are changing, that brainstorming's changing, the way we meet is changing, and multimodality can fit that space. I also think uh, public spaces in general, there's going to be multimodality there. Uh, you know, we think about devices you interacted with in airports, devices, as I mentioned, like at front desks, uh, things there. Uh, again, with the desire, I think a lot of this is going to be like shaping us post COVID, uh, possibly things like subways, there's just going to be like using gestures and, and all kinds of other things to make these experiences less frictionful and more fluid. I think there's a lot of move going to be a lot of movement in that space. And I, you know, what I, I hope is that we're we're going to get to a place where it's interesting because I do, I see the phone and the PC kind of lagging and, and I think that's going to remain the same. I do think that the phone could be a really interesting sort of last mile solution for a lot of these things. Uh, you know, use the phone to do voice capture, like if you have headphones or something and you're in a public space, because um, maybe a microphone is not practical in a subway, but if I have headphones and I've got your app, uh, you know, I can tell the system what I want to, to purchase or something like that, instead of sorting through 17 options for fares or, or things like that. So I think there's some interesting potential in broadening the way we use smartphones and wearables as a proxy for input devices and shared spaces, also in offices. But uh, again, I think it's going to be a slow burn on that. In the short term, we're, I think we're we're maybe going to see some more elder care scenarios because again we've got uh, some folks who are maybe on the elder path and covid may have accelerated their path to disability uh you know echo show was released uh, very much with the elder care scenario in mind and there's been research around how, uh, the way elder folks interact with <laughs> she's she she always triggers once echo stop uh they very much focused on uh how folks interact with those devices. So I sort of see that short term and the longer term play of like, okay, how do we really use people's devices as that last mile? How do we transform public and shared spaces so that uh, they're more equitable and that they're safer for post COVID? Cheryl, thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a great note to end on. Um, this has been a really interesting talk and I'm sure you've planted the seed in all of our minds uh, for multimodal considerations in the future as we bring that into our design work. Um, this has been really great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And folks can find me on social media. I'm very active there, but it was lovely to meet you all. Thanks for sticking around and uh, best of luck to you in all of your designs on the final frontier. Yeah, thank you Bye, so much everybody. for your talk. I remember, um, I haven't thought of it as like virtual whiteboards enable more accessibility because like physical whiteboards, there's like a power dynamic. I thought that was like super interesting. I would never look at physical whiteboards the same again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's it was really eye opening for me that first study with that team. I was like, wow, like a whole region was being locked out of, of yeah. fully participating. And they were, they were so super excited about that element, not COVID itself, but like mural when we brought that online, they were like, yes. This. Yeah, I love your own big jam and all these virtual whiteboard tools. Cool. Um, bye everyone on YouTube. I'm gonna